So a lot of my friends told me how excited they are about this talk here today. And I'm not quite sure whether they're really excited about the C-Spot concept or what their sick minds tell them we're about to discover. <laughs> so I want to bring it out to them. It is C, with a capital C. <laughs> so what does C-Spot stand for? C for me stands for creation, not creativity, but actually being able to create something out of nowhere and make it a new fact of life for generations to come. And this creation concept has been my obsession since my very early childhood. At that time, obviously, my father was my superhero. I love the fact he was an athletic champion, which is obviously something I did not inherit. <laughs> I loved his style, I loved going all around the world with him, but the thing I was most passionate about was listening there for hours and hours to his lovely stories, the stories he used to tell me and my friends. We used to learn a lot from that. However, at the time when my friends used to ask all kinds of questions around the stories themselves, I, on the other hand, with my big round curious eyes, was always asking questions beyond the story, wanting to know about the creation. So who actually created that story, if it's Sinbad, for example? Who the hell knows who wrote Sinbad in the first place? So if that's too much of a difficult question for you, so who came up with the idea of building the first ship that Sinbad sails in? Who created this, who created that, how it was done? So I was always very uh, taken with knowing about creation and how things started. And obviously that very innocent gathering of very small kids ended with my awkward question of, now, how are babies created? <laughs> and that one he never answered, actually. <laughs> anyway, at that age, I made myself a promise I would create something out of nowhere. I will leave a legacy. I will be one of those people who will build something. And I started, actually, at the age of nine, I designed a car engine that, tries, uh, that runs on water vapor. And this is actually my 30-year-old sketch. I still have it. And I actually went on the production process of it. However, I used my mom's kitchen tools and cleaning tools as raw materials, and you can imagine how it ended. <laughs> so, <laughs> this didn't go very well. So I went into another project that's much more manageable in a way, something I can do inside my room. However, this one also was halted because my blueprints were found in the basement, and let's just say they revealed too much. <laughs> So at that moment, my parents decided that it was much better to like, guide my talents and energy into what they considered as safer options <laughs> for everyone. I still don't know why. Anyway, time passed, and I grew into becoming a brand manager in an international company, which is anyone's dream. However, my old questions, <laughs> my old questions kept haunting me now. What the hell am I doing with my life? Where's my childhood dream? Where's my passion of storytelling? What am I creating? What would I tell my kids when they ask me with pride? This is what I brought into humanity. So I eventually quit my safe option job and went to start a business with an aggressive vision, which was a fancy way of telling myself simply, just follow what your spirit tells you. Do what you love doing. Go ahead with storytelling and make a living out of it. However, I didn't want to just like write books or create uh, movies or any, anything of the such. I wouldn't be creating anything new. I wanted to actually convince CEOs and presidents and GMs of global multinationals to let me help them convert their boring visions and strategies into inspirational stories that they would go ahead and tell their people and get their attention exactly like my father was getting our attention, and eventually deliver much better results. It's a very weird vision, right? But you know what? It worked. <laughs> and I am currently running a multi-million dollar business out of an industry that does not exist, an industry that I created for myself, from my own passion. And with the help of 30 of Egypt's best talents, we are able to spread that vision way beyond Egypt into the whole of Africa, Middle East, and Europe. We are actually able to export inspiration, and we're being recognized for that globally at the highest levels. Now, this was all only possible with a set of behaviors 
that I gathered together and put in what I'm now calling the creation spot or the C-spot model. In a very simple way, it's that sweet spot between my mind, my heart, and my soul. So first of all, what led me here is really starting where my spirit told me. Starting with the thing that I truly love and love what I do. Not just be okay with it, not feel it's fine temporarily, but truly love it, want to marry it, want to live with it forever. And then once I'm there, I create the set of skills to turn it into a business, into a job, and put all my mind on it, sharpening those skills day after day until I learn it, not just know it, not just understand it, but really learn it and master it and be the very best at it. And once reached, sustainability is key. Now, it's not the idea of coming up with new stuff every single day, but just sustaining what you're best at and making sure you make it better and better every day so you get to the level where you actually live it, you breathe it, you dream of it, in everything you do. So actually, if we're able to touch that sweet spot, or maybe touch is not the right word when we talk about sweet spot. <laughs> I mean, when we reach that, this is what helped me over the past 17 years in my professional life to get where I am today. But only in the last 17 days, this model has manifested itself to me in the most magnificent way and totally changed my life. So I was on that business trip between Johannesburg to Dubai to Paris and then back to Cairo. I'm talking thousands and thousands of miles in less than five days. I'm talking 30 degrees of temperature difference between takeoff and landing. And a lot of jet lag, obviously. So I went back to the hotel where my pregnant wife and three boys are staying and slept at around 3 a.m. I was dead tired. And just under an hour later, I started hearing this repeating sound. I didn't need him. <laughs> now it was three. <laughs> Actually, it looks like four, huh? <laughs> something, something happened by four, I'll tell you that. So I started hearing this repeating pattern in, this, uh, in my mind. Uh, I don't know whether I'm dreaming or not, so... Eventually I woke up, I jumped off bed, and I ran to the bathroom of the hotel room, only to find my wife in extremely bad shape. And these are actually her sounds of pain. She was in extreme pain. So on the, under all the confusion, I, I went like, oh, what do you need? Is there something I can do? How can I help? Are you in labor? Do we need to go to the hospital? She couldn't even answer any of those questions. She was just repeating those sounds. One thing led to another, and without having any chance to call any doctor or ambulance or anything, we came to the scary conclusion that I have to personally deliver that baby here and now, or they both die. Less than 10 minutes later, I had my baby girl in my arms. And at that moment, I was pretty sure I had already delivered the dead baby because, I mean, we hear all sorts of things around oxygen deprivation. And I have a lot of friends who are doctors, you, you, like you study this for a long time, and then you don't always get it right. So I started tapping on her back out of courtesy and love for my dead baby. But with God's grace, a few seconds later, she started actually breathing and, and crying. So with all the excitement, I gave her to my wife, and I ran out to call the doctor and tell her what happened. So the doctor obviously told me, you have to take them now to the hospital. I explained to her to what extent my wife is in extreme pain. She's unable to move, especially they're still attached with that cord. <laughs> Which is when the doctor actually freaked out on me, and she told me with trembling voice, Temer, are you telling me you did not take the placenta out? So I go, what the hell is the placenta? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so with the same trembling voice, she tells me, if you do not take the placenta out of your wife, now she dies. So I actually go back to the bathroom and put this, this, this very same phone, actually on the sink and put her on speaker and start getting kinds of instructions as to how to do that. 
and I operate on my wife and eventually got the placenta out and took the baby with the cord and placenta and placed her on the bed of the room and just covered her in a towel trying to get her warm. And that was the first time I had a chance to pick up the phone and call the reception and ask for help. Like, get me an ambulance, I just delivered the baby in the bathroom. <laughs> so obviously the, the reception guy is not equipped for such calls at dawn. <laughs> that was at four. <laughs> this call was at four. <laughs> so, yeah, four or seven she was born. So, but he started registering the concept and, and, and eventually he started acting. So I grabbed the first pillow and a cover and went back to my wife to comfort her. And I, I, and I went on my knees because she was on the floor. I went on my knees and I took her in my arms and started comforting her and telling her everything will be okay. And it's a, as if she had this feeling like she had accomplished her mission in a way and she's not needed anymore. So at that moment, she took an extremely deep breath with a very loud and unforgettable sound, I'll never forget that. And she opened her eyes wide open and rolled back, looking at me, and she fell in my arms, with no pulse, with no breathing, with no life in her. At that moment, I lost my wife of 13 years. I lost my love of 24 years in a bloody and messy, cold hotel bathroom floor. So I went hysterical and started screaming and screaming, stay with me, don't leave me alone, I can't live without you. I'm not designed for that. No man is designed to lose his wife. A few moments or seconds or minutes later, I don't know. She just came back. With the grace of God, she came back and she just pushed me this way and she said, give me space to breathe. And I'll tell you that, that's the first time in my life I, say, I take such a statement from a woman with big joy, huh? <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually the ambulance came and took us all to the hospital. And a couple of hours later, the doctor told me this procedure was done as if by a pro. And they're, they're both very fine, and uh, they're ready to go home in a couple of days. Now, a lot of my friends who witnessed that, they asked me the question, how were you able to do that? How was that even possible? And the answer is very simple. My father was no superhero. He was just a loving father. And it's that love that inspired me so long. And I am no superman. I am a simple and humble, loving husband who loves his wife more than anything else. And it's that love, that genuine love from inside, that gave me the motive and the power and the capability to actually learn an extremely complex procedure of delivering a baby through maybe gathering different shots from different movies I've seen in my life, Common sense? Is it common sense? Listening to a speakerphone in a messy situation of a doctor who's already freaked out? <laughs> but really learn it and master it and make it in the right way and actually live the whole experience with my full heart, with my full focus and energy until I'm sure that they are in safe hands before I totally collapse, which is what I did actually after the doctor told me. I was taken to emergency, but that's another story. <laughs> I said, I'm not Superman. Huh? Now, the good news is, Nermeen, my lovely wife, she's back home with her lovely smile as usual. Sophie, my baby girl, she's already had her double piercing on the... She's <laughs> the first girl after three boys, so you can understand the... And actually, a, a dear friend of mine told me with that grand entrance, she will change the world one day. And I'll tell you that, she already changed mine. And she made me believe and understand that 
with that love and mindset in mind, I was able to help create something much more important and precious than a business. As for me, I'm a proud father. I have my name on my child's birth certificate as a father and as the person who delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and one last thing. I believe that this specific part was God's way of giving me the answer of that question I kept nagging my father about how our baby is delivered. <laughs> <laughs> I guess now I have a first-hand look for that. So I would urge you to please go ahead and try and discover your C spot. Just love whatever you're doing and learn it and live it, and then you'll be able to create miracles. Thank you very much.